Hi, everyone. My name is Drew Bradsock. I'm the Senior Product Manager at Google, based here in Canada. We've got a very exciting Google Hangout scheduled for today with the Honorable Tony Clement, President of the Treasury Board of Canada and Member of Parliament for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Minister Clement is actually the federal government's chief advocate for open data, and it's been leading an initiative to help the government of Canada get much more of its data out for broad public use. Right now, this is actually the first hangout we've done with a Canadian politician, and we're very excited to have Minister Clement and the panel here to talk about a very important topic, about how open data and open government can really fuel innovation within Canada. Welcome, Minister. Well, thanks very much uh, to you and to all of Google Canada for being part of this uh, groundbreaking event. It's uh, my honor to be part of it as uh, President of the Treasury Board and as a member of uh, the Government of Canada. And uh, thank you for all of our participants who are part of the Google Hangout and uh, all of the uh, viewers and participants we hope to have uh, involved in this process. Just uh, wanted to frame this properly and uh, talk a little bit about uh, open data. Uh, open data is a worldwide movement. Um, all of us understand that uh, for decades and decades, governments have collected uh, bits of information about uh, our country and about our citizenry. Uh, and uh, that usually sort of went into the vault uh, in, in government, uh, stored away, as I like to say, like your grandmother's silverware. Uh, and now there's a, a general consensus, and uh, this consensus is growing, that that data is important for society. It's important as citizens, but it's also important to unlock the innovative and entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, so when you get that data online, uh, what it means is that that data can be uh, recycled and, and used for, for other beneficial purposes. Uh, when you turn on your weather app on your smartphone, that uh, weather data comes from government data. Uh, when you want to know whether uh, your the uh, wait times at the border are are too long or they're they're fine, that information comes from uh, from government data. When you use your Google Map app, uh, that information, uh, when it comes to the public transit routes, comes from open data that is supplied by municipalities across the continent. So those are just a few examples of data that is applied. Uh, by organizations and businesses in a way that is beneficial to the citizen or the consumer. Consumer. So we want to keep that going. Um, the Government of Canada has posted over 272,000 data sets online at data.gc.ca and we will continue to post more and more data sets. So we are part of this open data worldwide movement. But what we want to do is make it better. And what we want to do is make it better through the input uh, via crowdsourcing, via this, this Hangout, so that we have uh, the, the tools available for citizens to use that data to their benefit. And so one of the issues, of course, is how do we reformulate the portal uh, so that it's uh, user-friendly, uh, so that the information is, is accessible and usable uh, for people. Uh, that's just one of the questions that I'm really interested to get some feedback on today as we continue our consultation. So that's a long way of saying thanks to everybody for participating in this. I'm, I'm here at your service uh, for the next uh, little while, and we've got some experts uh, online as well. Thank you. No, our pleasure, and thanks for joining us, Minister. I want to introduce the panel, and uh, I was going to introduce them as really innovators in, in open data, practitioners and developers in this space, but saying they take my grandmother's silver and unlock the value of it will sort of imply they sound a little bit like thieves, so we don't want to go with that introduction. But with that, I do want to introduce a great panel that we have. We've got Ashley uh, Kazavan, who's joining us from Edmonton, Alberta. So Ashley, if you can give a wave so everyone at home can see who you are. Thank you, Ashley. Ashley is strategic coordinator for the chief information officer at the city of Edmonton, and has been leading a great number of really new initiatives to unlock the value of data for not only the city of Edmonton, but the broader community, so that ordinary people out there can get great use of the data. I think Minister Clement's talk about the municipal data feeding into Google Maps and increasing its value is a very good one. As well, joining us today is Albert Lai. Now, Albert is an Albert, if you can give a big wave to the studio audience. Thank you very much, Albert. So Albert is the co-founder and CEO of Big Viking Games. But what makes Albert really unique, and I think gives him a good view on use of data, this is his sixth startup. And this, moves, this continues on from what he's doing with Contagion, 
that Albert has a great deal of experience working with a large amount of data, and he's going to be giving his views on open data today. On top of this, joining us from Seattle is Kevin Merritt. Kevin is the founder and CEO of Socratic, and Kevin beat me to the punch, so Kevin gave the royal wave already. But Kevin's uh, firm, Socratic, really specializes in helping public bodies get access and use open data properly. On top of that, we have Edward Ocampo Gooding. So Edward, if you can give a wave. Oh yeah, hello. I like your grandmother's silverware. OK, perfect. And it, it's very nice. So it's good silver if you can find it. That's great. So, uh, so Edward is a co-founder of Open Data Ottawa, hopefully not the location by silverware. But uh, he's also the developer advocate for Shopify. So Open Data Ottawa really encourages the usage of open data across many different peoples and groups. And I think having an Ottawa is key. Uh, this is where Minister Clement is based when he's not back in his home riding at Perry Sound, Muskoka. But it's a great way for the local community to interact with the federal government. And Edward's been a, a big advocate in that space. So joining me actually studio left, he's just down the hallway, so you have to pretend he's in touching distance, is Ray Sharma. So Ray, if you can give a wave. So there's Ray. And don't judge Ray by the t-shirt for those of you not based in Toronto. So uh, no tweets, <laughs> no questions on the possible success of the Maple Leafs. That's not the topic of today's call. But Ray is the founder and chairman of XMG Studios. Ray is extremely well known worldwide for his expertise in mobile gaming. And actually, he's also the founder of the great Canadian Appathon Hackathon, which is a great way for different developers to get together and, and try and improve all their code and develop new applications. So welcome, Ray. Now, we've already had an introduction from Tony Clement, but we have another member of the government joining us. And definitely last but not least is Stephen Walker. Stephen, if you can give a big wave. All right, there's Stephen joining from his office up in Ottawa today. So Stephen is part of the Treasury Board Secretariat, and Stephen has actually been instrumental in forming the portal, the data.gc.ca. And don't worry, uh, we'll be repeating that URL uh, a couple of times throughout it. We highly recommend all our viewers taking a look at it. This is the Open Canada portal, or uh, the Open Data portal for Canada. This is the core of what we're going to be talking about today. This is a huge shift for the Canadian government in terms of the amount of information they've made available to the public. And the portal is really being the central area for all this data, and Stephen has been a huge driver. So I apologize. I just have to open up the moderator screen here so we can have the questions. With that, we're going to start getting into it. Um, before I give an introduction, I do want to highly encourage the, the studio audience, or all of you joining in online today, to participate. This isn't a panel just between the panelists and Google. This is really about hearing from the Canadian public with the questions you'd like to know more about on the topic. So what I'd like to encourage is ask questions, either on the Google Canada G Plus page. So you can post questions there, and we'll bring them up. I've actually got an application in front of me that'll see the questions come through my moderator. So we highly encourage this. Also, you can tweet. And the tweet here is I'm just bringing up which one it is. My apologies. Here we go. So you can tweet us at Google Canada using the hashtags either open data or the hashtag Clement Hangout. So once again, you can tweet us at Google Canada using the hashtag open data or Clement Hangout. So definitely have the tweets come in, either with comments or questions, and we'd love to hear from everyone out there. We'll weave the questions in across the next hour. With that, <laughs> let's get started. So back in 2011, the government of Canada launched, or first launched, the Open Data Portal. And as I said, that's a data.gc.ca. This portal is really a, a key mechanism for the government to make freely available the large amounts of information we have on health, on agriculture, on the environment, so that others within the community can build on it and give new applications for the public. And I think Minister Clement's reference to Google Maps is a great example how apps can build on this data and make it even richer and more valuable to the community. But we'd love to see more people across Canada do this as well. Now, in 2013, world governments have increasingly realized the value of public data and how it can be a huge catalyst for innovation. Part of this, we're re the Canadian government's been looking at rebooting and is rebooting the open data portal, giving new tools, new improvements, and new features. So what we'd really like to talk about at this point is a first question for the minister. So 
on open data and why it matters, that we'd love to hear why do you want an expanded open data portal in Canada, and what do you see as the potential here for the Canadian public? Minister? Thank you. Uh, certainly, I'm very excited about uh, widening this. I think that uh, I mentioned earlier how important it is for uh, innovation in our society, uh, consumer-friendly innovation, uh, innovation that spreads uh, information and usable applications like mobile apps. The, all of that is uh, so terribly important if we want to be an innovation society. So it has that function. The other, the other side of the function, the functionality, though, is it, 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 it keeps the interaction going between government um, and the public on issues that they care about. It creates a continuous feedback uh, loop mechanism where a public can have their say on issues. So open data in itself uh, is the access to information so that, uh, that people can be better informed uh, about uh, the issues that affect them. But the other side of that is, you know, it's, it's basically another application of crowdsourcing because when you get that feedback because people are more informed, they have the information available to them, they uh, can contribute to public policy formulation from, uh, from a position of advantage because they have literally as much information as uh, the government does. So really, that's, um, that's almost, uh, uh, it's, it's almost the first time in history uh, that, that you can say that the government, the governors, and the governed, when we have access, perfect access to the same information, we can have general, genuine collaboration on public policy issues. So I'm very excited about it from an innovation point of view, but I'm also excited about it from the point of view of getting better governance. So let's pull in the panel. Um, all of your experts and longtime advocates in building businesses around open data, what are we looking at? So how do you feel that Canadians are using this open data already, and what opportunities or new opportunities does it offer Canadian businesses? So with that, I'm actually going to open up to the panel on that question. So anyone wants to chime in, where do you think the biggest opportunities are either for your own firms, right, or for the people you work with on using that data being provided by the open data uh, portal? So with that, I open it up to any member of the panel. Sure. Uh, I can take a stab at this. And just so, as a reminder, during the first couple of times, if you could mention your name again. Hello. Because I, I went through it kind of quickly. So thanks, Edward. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Edward. Uh, during the day, I work at Shopify. At night, I'm at Open Data Ottawa. So, um, like a superhero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so during the day, I run Shopify's App Store. Uh, we have a great API. It's a platform, which is pretty close to uh, what Open Data does for the government. And I can definitively tell you that um, something like Open Data or an API uh, really acts as as a kind of like bureaucratic lubricant, which sounds weird, but like go with me here. So um, in every bureaucracy, you've got, you've got all sorts of sources of friction, and something like open data reduces that because it makes everything easier to collaborate on. Uh, it shines extra light on particular issues. Um, it just lets everyone like fix things themselves. It makes things easier to, to, to work on. Um, and so having said that, I think the, the emergent consumers of, of open data at a government platform are probably going to be working in that space more than like the external side. Like I expect to see more things being generated by companies to help governments fix their own issues in terms of efficiencies and like see where there are costs that could be reduced or see where there's collaboration that could be had that, that didn't or hey, that's that, that couldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Um, like we have seen issues where like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with an application called Flightcaster. No. So um, Flightcaster is really cool. It tells you when your plane is really going to leave or not, and right. um, it's a consumer-facing uh, app. So like someone like me can put Flightcaster on my phone, and it's it's able to exist because uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation releases its data. So that's really cool. That's really amazing. But I think that we're going to see probably fewer of those in the next little while and more uh, applications that, that are more government-focused in making that platform more efficient. 
So actually, that's a that's a good point in terms of what the U.S. is doing in Canada. So Stephen, you were part of the <coughs> excuse me Canadian delegation to the Open Government Partnership meeting in Brasilia uh, in April 2012. What have you seen that's been happening globally uh, versus what's in Canada, and how did that meeting influence what's going on right now with the Open Data Portal? So Stephen, over to you. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think that um, because open data as a area of activity um, under open government um, has really been highlighted um, by the OGP specifically, by the Open Government Partnership, you see that in the 50-odd countries so far that have already joined formally uh, the Open Government Partnership, a, an activity stream specific to open data that just wasn't there before. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are, are you know, you know, day to day counting the number of open data sites that, that happen to exist at, at any one time. But it's, it's been accelerating rapidly over the course of the last 12 months, which, you know, does correspond with the, with the, 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 the communications and conversation around the Open Government Partnership itself. The other thing I think that's happening specifically because of the OGP is that they're acting as a hub, um, almost like a, uh, a brokerage to put together, uh, you know, a, a nationality or a jurisdiction that wants to do something um, um, with open data and doesn't necessarily have the tools or the knowledge with, a, with, a, with another jurisdiction which is maybe a little bit farther down the road so that they can sort of um, get in the game faster by transferring best practices and some, some proven uh, uh, processes and development ideas. Um, uh, you know, we're, we've worked with a couple of other countries to provide information on what we've done so far. Um, the Americans have, have done quite a bit of that, um, as has the, the UK. So do you find Canada is both in a give-and-take relationship with them? Like we're contributing in terms of the work we've been leading with our portal and also learning from others across the Commonwealth and obviously our neighbors to the south as well. Do you well, find we, it's more a give or a take at this point? Um, I think um, it depends on which group of jurisdictions you're talking about. Okay. So, you know, if when it comes to those countries that are a little bit farther along, the UK uh, uh, and the Americans, for example, um, it's a much more of a two-way street where we're really more focused in on how do we create international standards that are going to make us um, all equally um, more efficient going forward. Um, whereas if you're talking about um, um, uh, developing nations, then it's a lot more, um, this is what we have found has worked for us, it might work for you too. Okay, no, that's good. And that's how Canada can help other countries on this as well. So actually on that, so rather than just looking at sort of the, the global view of this, I think it's very particular or very important that we look at regional issues. And that's one of the key reasons we've got Ashley here. So Ashley, what has really worked for the city of Edmonton and the surrounding areas with open government and open data and what hasn't worked? Like what are some of the challenges you've walked through? Because it's certainly not perfect. Open data is very challenging, which is why we've got yeah. the panel. So we'd love to hear your views at the Edmonton level. Yeah, and I think that Stephen did a really good job explaining what's happening on an international scene, and that's so relevant to what's happening municipally. So uh, the city of Edmonton works quite closely with municipalities all across Canada, but most specifically, some of the leaders in open data have been Toronto, Ottawa, and Vancouver. And so the nice thing is we've been able to work together as municipalities to actually come up and problem solve around those issues because there aren't, you're calling us experts and I'm sitting here a little bit nervous about that uh, because I don't think there are actually any experts in this field. We're all really working through this together and we're um, coming up with these challenges and I know that it's really nice to have three other people that I can pick up the phone and say, how did you get this data set or how uh, did you convince um, the finance department <laughs> to give you some financial <laughs> data? So I think that we do definitely look to people at other orders of government, um, it, and I've worked lots with Stephen prior to this, and so I think that's the key though, what he's saying is there, and you mentioned a give and take uh, relationship right now, that's the state where all municipalities are at, is we're figuring out what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we can best um, articulate the value of releasing data to citizens and um, not only actually we're seeing the value being an internal thing as much as it is an external value. So yes, we're seeing lots of people make really great apps and I think that um, things that happen or data that we're releasing at a local level is the most tangible 
And so it's easiest for people to make uh, garbage collection apps or uh, apps of when that will give you alerts when uh, fields are open or closed. And those are helpful for people um, every day of their life. Um, but it's really interesting when you can start to partner with different orders of government and the barriers um, between those different orders of government are disintegrating because we're collaborating more and people are just accessing services from government. And I think so that's what we're starting to do. No, that, and that's great. So let's hear from the people who have to deal with when the rubber hits the road, right? Because a lot of us talk about opening up that data. But I have a data background. Uh, I worked with databases for years and years. I know opening up and then working with and using it is often a huge challenge. So I'd love to hear from Albert or Ray or Kevin on the challenges that they've seen, or also what have they done to, to leverage this. But I think the challenge is probably the most interesting uh, information for our audience and for the other panel. So I'll turn over to any of you gentlemen. Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, I'll chime in. Uh, I'm Kevin uh, from Socrata in Seattle. And uh, really what, what we've been seeing through the eyes of our customers is that they're trying to reach really three different core external audience groups, and each of them have different needs. So the, the way governments have been sharing data historically, they've reached one of those core constituent groups pretty well. Those are what we think of collectively as scientists, analysts, researchers, journalists, economists, basically folks who are comfortable dealing with bulk data. They're going to take that data from the government open data site and they're going to drop it into some sort of a statistical analytical package or software and try to analyze that data. And, and today, kind of the state of the art of most government organizations sharing data, they're reaching that audience the best. But the other two audiences that are equally important that we're really trying to reach in ways that are specific or experiences that are specific for those audiences. One, one other stakeholder group are developers and entrepreneurs. So as Edward mentioned, they, they generally prefer application programming interfaces around the data so that it's not just a, a bulk download of a CSV or a, of a zip file, but actual real-time application programming interfaces to be able to access that data. Um, but what we're finding is APIs alone are insufficient. What you also need around APIs are all the documentation, bootstrap code, and a number of popular web development languages like Python and PHP, uh, test consoles, you know, a, a wealth of resources around the APIs. And then the third class of users of government data, and the one where I think most governments uh, have really not done enough yet is just everyday average com consumers of fairly moderate technical sophistication. And what we're really seeing now is these consumer style experiences being wrapped around data so that people can understand how the government is functioning and the decisions that the government is making in very consumer style ways. So as an example, a you know, fairly small town outside of Boston, Somerville, Massachusetts, just this week launched uh, an open checkbook application that looks very much like a check register with an actual kind of copy of a check, a very easy to understand metaphor for somebody in Somerville to uh, access how the government is spending its money in uh, Somerville. Hopefully no check fraud or the ability for citizens to log in and change said checkbook because uh, that, that's a little too open. I don't think either Stephen or Minister Clement would want a very open checkbook. But actually, that's a good point. In terms of opening up, how have we found it, especially from the Treasury Board, a blank checkbook to the Treasury Board, I, I think would knock over well with the Prime Minister or the Canadian people. But Alan and Ray, how have you found actually work at the APIs? What have you done in this space that's worked and hasn't worked? And then if you've got any stories in particular on working with Canada with this data, I think that would be great. So guys. Well, I'll chime in for a couple of seconds here. So my name is Albert Lai. I'm, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of a company called Contagion, and I'm also CEO of a company called Big Viking Games. But that's uh, a Contagion. One of the things that Contagion did was recently launch a, a, a 10K prize for um, the best uh, implementation of, um, uh, of something interesting in the visualization for uh, Toronto's open data side. Uh, we had 300 people apply. Um, we had representatives from 36 different countries. And I think the fact that we had people from over 30 countries is what's really interesting to me. It's the fact that um, it's, it's, the data is, is so easily accessible. Um, you know, this is something that we couldn't have done just even a few years ago. And we can attract 
um, top tier world class talent to to help analyze our data, help uh, help us understand our own data in our own cities from other cities around the world, uh, and vice versa. So this global movement of creating a a body of um, what what I, from what I've seen mostly open source uh, technologies to help um, each and every city that gets involved with open standards to have an open way of sharing code and sharing technology, sharing modules. I think that's a really incredible opportunity for for us as can as, as Canadians, but just as global citizens to help each other out in, in building a very very interesting platform for for creating change. Can, can, I, uh, can I can I just yeah, jump in? Ahead, uh, uh, can I just jump in on the the last comment on on open source and uh, the previous comment about open checkbooks and uh, whatnot? Uh, but uh, there there really is a, a a very positive story here, and I'll give you the example of the license agreement that is part of open data that sometimes things have to be licensed. And uh, we, we had a very cumbersome license agreement uh, in place before, and we changed it. And what did we change it to? Well, we changed it to the open source available license agreement that the UK had already posted and uh, had already been seen to be working extremely well. So rather than having, you know, 10 bureaucrats working in office somewhere, costing the taxpayers money, working on a you know, a license agreement just for Canada. We went to the best of breed, open source, uh, tacked on, uh, you know, uh, the on that, that license agreement, the Canadian application, but basically it was open source. So didn't cost any money, uh, is best, uh, best of breed, uh, and it's something that will make it easier for uh, citizens in Canada to, uh, to download data. So there's a really good example of a cost-effective way that we are using technology to uh, make something better. Thanks, if I Minister. can just jump in yeah. on that, though, I think what the federal government's done with adopting the license is a great example for how we can collaborate going forward. Not only did they adopt the UK license, but they posted it on the website and allowed people to actually contribute comments to it um, so that they were actually establishing a uh, license that other cities would be comfortable adopting or other governments would be a comfortable adop comfortable adopting and that's huge because we felt like we got a say in it and now we can take ownership over that license and that license is now being used or hopefully <laughs> when we adopt it will be used all across Canada and we have one license and so the users of it can be whether you're making a game or an app and you're in Edmonton or you're in Ottawa or anywhere else over the world, if you're using Canadian data, you only have to look at it once. You don't have to figure out if you are legal in different jurisdictions. And so that's making a better user experience for people. So I think they've set a really great example of how to go forward. No, that's great, and thanks. And just so that people don't think I'm ignoring Ray because he's wearing a Leafs top, because I, I don't want that to be what's uh, remembered here, Ray, what do you think the business opportunities are for this are? Like, uh, you, you run your own company. Um, it's really your lifeblood. How do you think this helps you, and how can it help others? And we'll get to a couple of questions from the audience in just a second, but one of the questions that ties into this from um, Terry Mulke, and I apologize, Terry, if I mispronounced the last name via Twitter, was how would this benefit small business startups in small rural areas? So not just Toronto, but how do you think there's a benefit in, uh, outside of Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal? And how has it helped you business-wise? Sure. Um, hi, my name's Ray, and um, I do run a mo really cool mobile game studio right in downtown Toronto, right at King & Young, called XMG. But uh, the perspective I'd like to add to this discussion is that I've also been involved in investing in 30 early stage or first stage uh, investments in tech companies in, in the Canadian uh, area over the last five years, resulting in about a thousand new um, software development jobs, mm -hmm. several exits, including a company that Google bought, ironically. Um, which one? Bump Top, a company okay, called Bumptop, yeah. which uh, was a, a, um, a local grown company. And Google's actually bought five, Toronto, uh, Trump five companies in the local area. They've been a great um, part of the ecosystem. But the, the perspective I'd like to bring to this discussion is the perspective of the developer because I think a lot of those investments have gone into companies that have developed apps. And uh, so I've had the benefit of experience of, of several hundred million downloads worth of mobile apps. And what I thought I'd do is I would uh, help inspire the developers to look at the open data opportunity. And I did some research on some best practices around the world. And I thought I'd just share that uh, with you here today so that app developers could get a sense as to what is the opportunity out there 
let me give you some quick examples. That'd be fabulous. Thanks, Ray. So here in Canada, there's an app called uh, Emitter. It's a pollution app, and what it does is it measures pollution levels in different parts around the country, but they're not only restricted to Canada. You can look at other countries that have plugged in their open data and uh, check their pollution levels as well. There's another one in Canada called Save the Rain where you put your house and you, you can determine your water footprint um, based on you know, water trends and uh, you know, precipitation trends in your area. There's, a, there's an app on the, on the municipal level called Waterloo Parks Finder. It's very simple, but it's kind of cool. You can find all the parks in, in the city of Waterloo. In, uh, in the UK, um, I came across some interesting apps. There's this one app called the Open Corporation, which gets all the corporate data of all the all the work that, that all the projects they've done with the government, all their government filings is available for all the corporations. That was a very interesting one. Contracts. There was another one called B Part, which was uh, citizen participation for urban development. And there were some really cool visualization apps in the UK: bike paths, subways. You know. Bus schedule app uh, is a very simplistic app, but it's a great example of how you can actually affect productivity levels in our country. So you've got an application that tells you how long is your bus going to arrive at your favorite station. So let's think about it. Can you save a few minutes per trip, every trip, but also the anxiety you save in knowing when to be there for the bus? Like That's such a simplistic app, but it shows to me best the opportunity that open data represents, which is to literally affect productivity levels in this country. I'd like to continue on uh, quickly, because in India I found this very cool app where they had, uh, they had tapped into 3,000 boys that were watering, that were measuring salination and temperature levels. So I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, Battleship, but you could imagine that type of. In the US, um, they've got this new website called alpha.data.gov, which has really good um, um, you know, UI and very nice looking website. And um, there was the census app uh, or the census data in particular, they had amazing documentation for their API. So if you want to look at the cens US census as an example of good documentation on the API side, I would, I would encourage that. And the, the level of detail is interesting. There was a graduate fellowship app I, I found within, and, and the apps are divided between website apps and mobile apps, but uh, in the US, which Kind of interesting but scary. They actually disclosed even the emails of the graduates that won scholarships. Um, and uh, just one last point, which I'll conclude with, is that there is a, um, a website called datacatalogs.org, which provides it's an op it's it's all the uh, open data um, sources, municipal, state level, as well as uh, or provincial, as well as uh, uh, national. And uh, there's 295 da data sets in there, just for perspective. Uh, can, there's 36 Canadian. So the U I think the U.S. has just over 40, so Canada is doing really, really well in terms of representing itself. So I'd co go back to the bus schedule. If there's one thing you can remember in this, this long discussion, sorry. Um, is no, that, this is great. Uh, Thanks, Ray. Yeah, just remember that bus schedule, the ability to save time. That it has the, literally the effect, the ability to affect our national productivity levels. That's all i got to say about that. Thank no, you. that's fabulous. And actually, I, I want to encourage people again. Uh, we've got a number of questions here coming in, which is fabulous. Uh, you can either post to the Google Canada Plus page, right? So Google Canada's G Plus page, or uh, message us on Twitter at Google Canada with either the hashtag Open Data or Clement Hangout. So with that, I actually want to put a question out from ZGov uh, via Twitter uh, out to any of the panelists. How are citizens using this data sets? So Albert, uh, what's your view? I've got, I've got no sound. Did a Canadian win it? I think that you you've got a very development centric view of this. That's the question we all want to know. Did a, <laughs> a Canadian win the win the contest before? And how are citizens using the data right now? Uh, I I caught the last half of that. You, you cut out for a second, but um, I think I believe the question was. Who won the uh, the ten thousand dollar prize uh, that we put out for our open data contest? And uh, it was actually a uh, University of Waterloo. Was students. it a Canadian? Uh, so yes, it was a Canadian that won, and we're very proud of um, what Paul Butler did with the data. It was a, a fantastic um, visualization of um, the uh, uh, the traffic uh, data and the uh, transit data that we have here in Toronto. Um, so yes, I think there's a, there's a lot of incredible uh, uh, developers that are coming out of a lot of our universities here that, and many of which are very fascinated by all the, uh, the abundance of, of open data that's coming out. I think also to expand. Right, 
Now, a question. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead, Ashley, please. Uh, just what your question was around what citizens are doing with it, and to expand on one of Ray's examples, which I think were brilliant, is emitter.ca. Um, one of the people in Edmonton is actually working on that. Uh, thank you, Matt Dance from the U of A. And what they're doing is taking uh, data not only from the Canadian government, but they want to take personal devices, personal air quality machines, and then have that in a data catalog and potentially federate it with existing data catalogs and all these things need to be figured out but I guess where we're going next is how do we take quality data that's measured by citizens um, with guaranteed air quality measures and then integrate that so that we're getting be better air quality and more real-time data and what they want to do is for people with asthma they'll get an alert if they're going into an area that's saying this is a bad area for you back away so it's really a, a great example of how we can take data that we collect and compare it with what people are doing um, on their own anyway. Ash, no, that's, that's good. good. And that's actually, cool. another question from the from the audience. Uh, yeah. uh, Sorry, from Albert I, Reland I, via Twitter, I, and this is a, actually a question for Minister. Oh, go ahead, Albert. I, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I was just going to no, say, go ahead, ask Albert. That, Ashley. Um, no, and that's a really good point. And the, the one of the really fascinating things about this is that you can take all this open data and mash it up with data that is being collected all over the world through actual citizens um, that are becoming real live real-time sensors and I, this is this is something that is has incredible yeah. um, opportunity as, as as technologists as entrepreneurs um, as as fellow citizens because basically every time we, we walk out with our cell phones it's an incredible input device um, and there are you know literally billions of them out there that enable us to both receive information to affect the way that we, we function and be more productive by arriving at the right place at the right time or you know, just allowing us to be more efficient in our day-to-day -day activities, but but it's it's a it's a fantastic piece of, of technology allows us to to input um, data from all around the world. So I think you're going to see a lot of embedded technologies that will link up and synchronize with your um, your mobile device, whether it's through Bluetooth or through Wi-Fi. So I think over the next five years, you're going to see some incredible innovation around. I'm, I'm going to give uh, one one more example of that, if I could, uh, right right here. Uh, in Canada as well, in, in the city of Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario, northern Ontario, they've, uh, they've combined a, in one open data portal, not only the open data from the municipal uh, governments and other levels of government, but also the NGO open data and citizen open data. So they had a, they had a problem with uh, bears. So they, had a, they, they, allow, they encouraged people to uh, signal when they saw a bear, bear sightings. And they mapped that with the data that they had on garbage pickup, and lo and behold, they found that uh, <laughs> they found bears wherever the garbage was out the night before for the garbage pickup. So they were able to change their garbage pickup routes, and uh, bear sightings within the city dropped by 80 percent. So there's a really good practical example of using citizen data with government data, data and solving a problem that uh, was. Uh, that perhaps a bit menacing to the community. So again, more of that, we need to see that, but it is starting to happen. So Minister Clement, actually a, a good point on that. That's a really good regional example. Have you found there's been provincial, municipal, and federal cooperation? Because open data is very much at a federal level. How has your work or the work Stephen's been doing changed that? And what are the plans coming up to do more partnership between the three levels of government? Uh, absolutely essential that we all work together and uh, we do have some uh, early leaders. Uh, I'm glad to see Edmonton is online here. Uh, mentioned uh, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, I mentioned Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, there, there are some open data leaders uh, in our communities as well. So definitely want to work with them. I've had consultations with uh, those groups along with the City of Calgary and some others. And of course provincial governments. There certainly are provincial governments that are moving ahead with open data strategies and plans. Uh, I would say government of British Columbia, government of Ontario, uh, government of Alberta now is starting to move into this area too. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm engaging on all those levels. Uh, what I see is a, an opportunity for us to all work together, to learn from one another, uh, to, uh, to uh, improve one another's work, uh, which is important as well in government. So yeah, I, I see this as a not only a citizen-based movement, but also governments working together to get the job done right.
No, good point. Now, actually, this question goes out to both Edward um, and Stephen. So it's sort of two sides of the same coin. Uh, how, both of you work along a really energetic group of developers and open data gurus. Um, what do you find is of most interest to the people you work with, either outside the community or within the federal government, of the people who have a great deal of expertise in open? Sure. Um, the things that make money are nice. Uh, sorry, I see like people like dropping in and out. Is it okay? Should I keep going? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. The things that make money are nice. Um, visualizations and like the reports and like the analysis of data is, is really good, but I think where developers and entrepreneurs need to concentrate more on is realizing that uh, governments are exceptional uh, delivery mechanisms of infrastructure and usually not so great at the software around the like services that connect those infrastructure, those pieces of infrastructure to, to the citizens and the residents. So success stories uh, that we're seeing to pop up. Which are always good to hear as well, right? Because uh, there's yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of positive like, change. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there, there's definitely a uh, stable company money to be made here. A success story is something like recollect.net out of Vancouver, which started off as a hack uh, using available open data uh, that looked at garbage schedules. And it turns out that uh, municipalities, not only in Canada, but in other parts of the world have a real tough time uh, managing garbage schedules. It's not where um, citizens feel like money should be seriously spent, but it turns out that if one company does it really, really well, they can scale that out across the world, provide a, an exceptional service for a low price, and then everybody is happy. Um, but, but the data part here it is, is kind of hard to grasp, right? Because like the, usually, for the most part, the data is boring and it's useless by itself. Um, so D depends who you ask, right? You ask a statistician, no. and it'll always be exciting. But uh, I know what you well. Mean. No, uh, even to a statistician, um, the real joy in in seeing where like everything comes together is, is noticing. Oh, actually, like these people have these problems, and if we mash up these different data sets and we present it in this way, we consume it in this way then like now it's a gold mine, right? Like you see that with stories about Gold Corp and like, you know, Recollect and that kind of stuff. Um, so actually on that, just to build on that question, I'm going to modify what I asked Stephen a little bit. Stephen, what are some examples of really exciting innovation you've had within the government? Because you're doing a huge amount of work right now right. Um, mm -hmm. with open data. What are the things that get your own team really exciting? What innovations have you had? And then I'll be asking um, Kevin a really good question of what's going on in the US where he's seen some great innovation after that, too. Great. So Steven? Um, so uh, a couple of different things, I guess. Um, I, I just go back to, to something that the, the minister and both Ashley talked about already, is that there's a gigantic level of excitement around the potential for pan-Canadian federated open data. So the, the, the work that we do to, to drive interoperability between open data activities of British Columbia or Edmonton or the federal government recognizing the fact that users and developers are, are going to uh, want to combine and integrate data from multiple sources, um, that really gets us going um, um, internally. Um, the, the, all of the possibilities around the, you know, the, 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 the great leap forward rethinking around um, how we um, mount a, uh, an open data portal that does a lot more than the addition that the original um, open data portal, which is you know which was largely experimental at the beginning and was always um, a pilot. Um, um, moving that idea forward, specifically around user engagement, um, those of you who have who have used the the, the data.gc.ca to date will know that it doesn't come along with a lot of uh, tools for user engagement. Um, um, uh, our hope, coming out of events like this one today. Is to is to help drive the the design and delivery of that portal to maximize its function in terms of engaging the users or bringing users together um, with each other in order to sort of facilitate greater use, greater uptake of the open data. Um, and I guess just from a, a, a third uh, uh, point, and this kind of goes back a little bit to something Kevin said um, um, near the beginning of the event, and it's this idea that you know 
we are driven to, to deliver open data um, um, to developers to help with the, the development of apps, interesting, innovative ideas that will, you know, drive the kind of time efficiency uh, <laughs> that, that Ray mentioned earlier as well. Um, but we do have to remember to think about the citizens. Um, so the capacity for the platform or, you know, any government department or, or jurisdiction to kind of ensure that the data serves the citizens who may not be as technologically advanced as well um, is also very important to us. And that gets us very excited about things like visualizations um, and, and interactive tools that will allow the citizen to see data in different ways that mean something to them. So on that point, actually, Kevin, you work with a, a great deal of both uh, citizens and also public groups on open data, improving and using it. What innovation do you see in sort of contrasting in the U.S. or from the clients you work with uh, within the U.S. side of it? Or even if you've got Canadian clients, that's 100% fine, too. So, Kevin? Yeah, well, thank you for that. I mean, first and foremost, I'd, I'd point out the fine work that Ashley and her team are doing in Edmonton, really around you know, taking, taking open data to the next level and uh, you, you know this isn't as relevant in the US but snow removal I imagine is very important in the city of Edmonton and so Ashley and, and Chris and the team there in Edmonton have really done a fantastic job about sharing their goals around uh, snow removal and how they're performing against those goals so so that's one example uh, I mentioned the city of Somerville uh, earlier about how they really have kind of taken the consumer experience to the next level around uh, expenditure data that they're sharing with you know residents of very very uh, little technical sophistication uh, and so that's a that's a good example um, we're seeing like one of the things that that's really um, remarkable to me is what's going on in the greater Chicagoland area on two fronts one is um, uh, the city of Chicago has gone through the process of instrumenting almost all of their underlying business systems and transaction systems so that their data is showing up on the city of Chicago's open data portal in either real time or worst case nightly and that has really spawned a very vibrant developer community in Chicago to take that data and incorporate it and embed it in applications and systems downstream. The, the second thing that's kind of remarkable about the greater Chicago land area, and this kind of ties into a question that you asked earlier about regional cooperation between governments of different levels, uh, the city of Chicago, Cook County, in which Chicago is located, and the state of Illinois have jointly launched a federated open data portal called Metro Data Chicago or Metro Chicago Data org, uh, which allows a citizen to go and do a search and it'll it'll search across all three of those underlying open data portals and will provide uh, unified results. So so those are just some examples of, of some organizations that are doing some pretty neat things. And I guess the last one is um, City of New Orleans is doing some really interesting work around sharing uh, blight data, you know, basically properties that have no longer been uh, uh, habitable based on... Which is uh, quite sad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, they're, they're really doing a phenomenal job at sharing this data uh, in a number of ways, APIs for programmers, but in a very easy to approach consumer style experience for uh, residents of less technically uh, sophisticated means. That's great. Now, I'm actually going to change format a little bit. We've got a, a, a lightning round set of questions. Uh, a couple of them aimed at the minister to start. So uh, the minister is going to be in the open data hot seat a little bit on this. And the one question I have to ask, because if I don't, it's definitely going to pop up all over Twitter, because most people don't understand the challenges. But what's the real difficulty for the federal, provincial, and sort of regional gov government sh sharing healthcare data? That's a topic most people, when they think of open data, they think, oh, why can't we share all our health data? I think the minister's probably a good idea to let the Canadian public know the challenge he faces and others. So, Minister, over to you with that one. We've got a couple other ones coming up as well. But we'll start off with the, uh, the doozy one that a lot of people want to know. Uh, very, very, uh, very quickly. Obviously, uh, health data is very sensitive information. It's, uh, it's, it is private information on, on a micro level or individual level. So. Uh, a lot of that has to be ring-fenced, absolutely. Having said that, uh, some metadata can be very helpful, uh, and uh, specific data on uh, healthcare performance, uh, let's say uh, wait times at a particular hospital, 
that can be shared uh, much more freely. I would I would submit to you. Uh, we have to work with provinces on that that though because uh, the federal government doesn't collect that data. Uh, the provinces do. There is the Canadian Institutes for Health Information that tries to work with provinces on that. So you've got a sort of a constitutional division of powers issue because uh, provinces are the primary uh, givers of health care in our country. And you've got uh, the ring-fenced aspect of it, which is to do with uh, uh, the private information that should not, be, uh, should not be online. So aside from that, I think there's a lot of data that should be uh, available that could help our healthcare system uh, be better. And I forgot the great answer, so I forgot to mention that was from Walter Robinson on Twitter. A couple other user questions right now from Peter Johnson, also via Twitter, and this is the minister. Um, Peter, and I'm assuming he's speaking to the first person here, is nervous about the long-term implications of Gov as a platform. Does this let Gov withdraw from service provisions? So let me paraphrase, I'll interpret the, the tweet uh, for a second. Um, some people have concerns that the government is just going to dump the data out and may not actually offer some of the service themselves, like the bus schedule one. Do you, how do you feel that the data should best be used in the open data platform? Is the goal to just publicly make it available, or is the idea, but your own opinion, that we'll move on and start offering more services on top of this government data we make public ourselves? Well, look, I, I think it's, it's very much the latter, that, uh, that the purpose here is to share information that, we, that government's already collecting uh, you know, at, at various levels, uh, and get some feedback from that. So uh, the the worst thing to do is to make public policy decisions in a vacuum where there, there is no feedback mechanism for people uh, to react to it or uh, for for decision makers to uh, to come up with policy ideas. You know, the worst thing is you know bureaucrat X fourteen on the tenth floor of some building in Ottawa. Uh, making policy proposals to politicians without any uh, connection to what's happening in the real world. So I think we governments want to avoid that. Uh, politicians who want to be successful need to avoid that. Uh, and so this is all about getting that information out there, getting feedback, and making better public policy decisions. Thank you. Now this question goes out to the entire panel. And uh, I think this is quite useful for the audience at home who may not have the, the breadth of experience or technical skills many of you do. What's the best way for individuals to find the data sets they are looking for? So this goes out to anyone with your own views on this. I know you each have your own unique views, so I'll, I'll turn over our panel. Um, I don't think that that's something that we've actually truly accomplished yet. I That's one of the things when... I know Socrata has done a lot of really great work uh, talking about federated data catalogs and Kevin just explained the work being done in the US and we'd love to see something on this front in Canada. I think that's one of the big challenges though when I spoke earlier about municipal, provincial and federal government is people don't understand what data comes from where. So not only do they have a few barriers to entry to even figure out where that data is from but what municipality or what jurisdiction it's from so they can get it. Um, the easiest way right now is to do a Google search. That's why I find <laughs> everything. Uh, that shameless plug was not pre-scripted, by the way. So uh, if she'd said big, maybe we would have had some technical difficulties, but we'll move on from that. <laughs> All of a sudden mute. No, I, but I, I think that right now that's the challenge is that um, we're using traditional search engines um, for data as well and that's not always the first thing that comes up so people need to know what it is that they're looking for and just based on the last question I think that if people did have a better understanding of what data was available we could be doing more with it and creating better value cases for to get more data out there. Right. If I I just, I'd like to chime in there for a minute if I could Drew. I mean, there, yeah, there, this is Kevin from Socrata. There's a couple of thoughts on that. You know, one is a uh, you know, fairly controversial idea that uh, I think they, the, the concept of the data catalog is actually something that is going to ultimately give way, that, that it's a temporary vestige that allows somebody to go and kind of have an index into what the government is sharing. But this is, a, this is an area where actually we could all do more work with Google and with Bing to do a better job describing data so that you guys can actually do a better job uh, indexing it and producing results when people search for uh, things that ultimately can be answered by public data. And so schema.org is a great, a great first step. 
uh, but very candidly, it's not enough. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to do more about describing not only that this is a data set, but this is a visualization of a data set, or this is a time series, or this is an application that relies on this data set. So those are some things that, that, uh, that need to happen. Okay, so last, actually, uh, question from the audience. And this is a, a Google Plus question, so coming in from the Google Canada page. So the question is, open data can be a tremendous uh, tool for public good. Now, the CIDA just told us on Twitter they released new data sets. Maybe the panel can talk to international examples of open data success. So I'll open it up to the panel, and then uh, we'll actually close with remarks in a second. So to the panel, anyone? I'll point to country of Kenya. They're doing a phenomenal job using uh, data to really unite the spirit of the developer community and citizens across the country. Uh, other um, examples? That's a good one. So, Edward? Yeah. I've, it's killing me that I can't remember this guy's name. Uh, there was a gentleman from uh, a place that used to be near the place that used to be Yugoslavia, uh, an Eastern European country. So this this open data site was the number one uh, hit, like top search rank uh, for the country for a week. And what it was, it was um, a breakdown of the country's budget, and it had little sliders. So it's like, oh, you want to put more money into education? Okay, well, you're going to cost this many jobs in these other sectors. It was a really fascinating way of uh, using open data to fully engage with the country, get everyone really excited about realizing that being a citizen is part of being like the largest group work project possible. And it's like amazing that countries actually work in the first place. Um, I think that's the kind of stuff that I would love to see at a more like international democratic scale. No, that um, sounds great. I have one. Um, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Um, uh, I think the UK has a phenomenal um, um, open data site. And one of their best stories is around the the release of data on healthcare performance, specifically um, individual hospitals across the country and fatalities. And this information was made available and, and, and certain institutions could be identified as having a, you know, outside the scope of reasonableness um, um, a number of fatalities for the same sort of surgical procedures that were happening in other institutions. Over the course of the next, you know, six to 12 months, guess what happened? The number of fatalities in those institutions came down. By, by exposing the performance information, the individual healthcare institutions themselves had to find a way of doing their job better. Um, and, at the, and, and the outcome of that was actually you know, fewer deaths um, in, in those health um, institutions. If I could just go back just for a second to the previous question, because I mean, it was a really good one about how do we, you know, how do we help people connect better to the data that they need especially when they don't know um, um, who might have that data. I think it's important to, 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 for us all to still be aware of the fact that in many cases the data isn't available. Um, and it's, it's, it's critical that we, that we encourage the, the citizens or any user to ask for the data, um, especially once they've figured out what institution has it. Um, um, the, the more data that's requested, the faster um, 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 high demand data um, will be made available by any jurisdiction, I believe. No, that's a really good point. And actually, we're almost at the top of the hour, so I apologize, Edward. Well, we, we do have to wrap. Ah, okay. cool. um, I do want to make it clear that part of the Hangout, part of this, was actually a, a key part of Minister Clement's uh, consultation. Just like we're talking about openness, this is really a good opportunity for the minister and members of the government to hear from all of you online, so the questions are great, as well as for the panel. And this is going to help improve Canada's approach to open data and the portal we have is one of the, the main bastions of this. So with this, I'd really like to turn over to Minister Clement for his closing thoughts on this and his feedback on some of the questions that he's heard today. So Minister, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Google Canada for the Google Hangout and certainly our panelists uh, today and some of the feedback that we got uh, online even during this hour. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're, we're committed to improving the portal uh, at data gc.ca. Love to get some uh, feedback as we uh, have some formal consultations on this uh, and make it the best it can be. Uh, it really is a site uh, that is designed to be usable by the public uh, and we want it to be the best site in the world quite frankly. That's, that's our goal. So do, uh, do give us that feedback. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Tony Clement uh, CBC, CPC, Tony Clement CPC. 
uh, or uh, TonyClement.ca on the World Wide Web, uh, whatever suits your fancy. And, of course, uh, data.gc.ca is the government website. So I'm plugging those because we really do want to get some feedback from folks and, uh, and make sure that we can deliver better uh, open data to the public and that it has a very measurable impact on uh, how we improve our economy and how we improve citizen engagement within our government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. With that, uh, we're at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank Ashley from the City of Edmonton, uh, Albert Lai, the co-founder and CEO of Big Viking Games, Kevin Merritt from South of the Border, the CEO of Socratic, Edward Ocampo Gooding, co-founder of Open Data Ottawa and the developer advocate for Shopify, Thanks. Chris Sharma from XMG, Stephen Walker from the Treasury Board, and of course the Minister. With that, I'm Drew Bradstock, and uh, thank you much for joining. Look forward to seeing you on future Google Plus Hangouts for Canada. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much.